everybody, I'm Gloria Alvarez, and I'm here at the Anne Rand Institute in California. And now I want to share with you one of the most interesting things that I am going to do in the Institute. Thank you, Jeff Britton, for, for this amazing opportunity. Uh, Jeff is the author of this biography, illustrated biography of Anne Rand. You are also a consultant of the Anne Rand Archives, and you were also involved in the production of A Sense of Life, which is a, a, an amazing documentary that you can find online of Anne Rand's life. And now I get the opportunity of exploring more uh, on the life of Anne Rand through, through the archives that you guys have here. Yeah, the archives is a collection of materials by and about Ayn Rand and those influenced by her. And it, it basically takes into account a hundred or more years of evidence in all forms, letters, photography, uh, audio tapes, uh, interviews, newspaper clippings, uh, elements that went into the writing of her novels. Mm -hmm. All of this material is collected by us and arranged to make available to scholars and, and general researchers uh, the opportunity to explore in detail, the granular detail, the interesting things about this figure. I'm very excited into learning more about Anne Rand's life. I remember uh, reading Atlas Shrugged. It was the first book I read of her and I completely fell in love with uh, her brilliant mind and her ability to put together so many different subjects as they interact in life, right? She talks about politics and, and sex and love and religion and psychology and, and the struggle of making your own life. And, and I thought, wow, I mean, this amazing woman has all this knowledge, she develops a philosophy. And I think that when you get the opportunity of knowing more about the person, you can better understand why they thought the way they did and what they do, they did the, the things they do in life. And one of the ways to uh, consider that person and make them more real and tangible is the, are the things they collected? Are the things that they liked? Are the things that they kept that in the course of their day, their month, or their year, over the course of the lifetime, add up to a gigantic mosaic of information about their past and what they're doing in the present? So when people are interested in exploring Ayn Rand in detail, sometimes, uh, well, often, there's a, an overarching theme that guides their selection that they may be investigating a newspaper article, they may be writing a, a dissertation, but they come in here with some kind of part of Ayn Rand to discuss. Uh, her politics, her views on women, her views on uh, foreign policy, her views on philosophy. And sometimes people come in and ask about the details of her life of her biography. Well, I am very curious in general, but uh, one of the things that I'm curious about is uh, any relationship that she may have with Latin America. For example, she mentions my home country three times in Atlas Shrug, mm -hmm. which is Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, she also has the character of Francisco de Anconia. She mentions Chile. So uh, if there's anything uh, inside everything that, that you guys have here that can, you know, be, be leading to know what did she think about Latin America? Did she ever visit Latin America or had any friends from the mm -hmm. Spanish speaking world? Well, actually she, visited Mexico. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, in the, in the late uh, 1920s, uh, when she, after she arrived uh, to the United States, uh, she began the process of naturalizing. And one of those requirements was to go leave the country and return mm -hmm. in, the, in the course of processing her paperwork. So she actually, with her husband, um, drove across the desert of Southern California because they were living in Los Angeles at the time to, to Mexicali and spent the night there okay. and processed the papers and then returned the next day. Short honeymoon, 24-hour honeymoon in Mexico. That's cool. Yeah, and in fact, we act, I have uh, some papers right. related to that, uh, that activity that I can show you. All right. So here, in about the middle of the folder, is a letter that was a part of her processing a letter that she re received when she was living in Hollywood mm -hmm. from the American Consular Service in Mexicali. All right. Yeah, so, um, you know, it says, in accordance with your request, you will be duly notified as soon as an approved non-quota entry may be received here in this instance. And this goes on to 
to yeah. describe more of the, the details and specifics, the, the time of day that the consulate is open and so forth. Well, this is one of a, a number of different pieces of correspondence and documents and notes that add up to um, a little mosaic of the experience of right. becoming a citizen. Yeah, Mexicali, May 31, 1929. Wow, Vista del Mar Avenue. That was her address. Yeah, that was in Hollywood. Nice. That wasn't the only experience with Mexico, or a little wider, the, the Spanish language. Mm -hmm. um, in um, a Later on in her career, she established herself, of course, as a worldwide author and the author of The Fountainhead. And The Fountainhead was a, uh, adapted as a film by Warner Brothers, yeah. a big studio where she worked as a screenwriter in the late 40s. And that had an international impact. Well, here's, a, here's an interesting little clipping. All right. Related to... A Spanish censors Van Cooper film. Yes, this is from the LA Times, 1950. April 8, Madrid. A Spanish censorship board has banned the American movie The Fountainhead unless major changes are made. Gabriel Garcia, chairman of the censorship board, Censorship board. Well, yeah, Spain was under the dictatorship uh, and, yeah, horrible years. Said the church presented the principal objections to the film. Eugenio Hernandez, one of those agent in Madrid, said it would be impossible to tone down the dialogue without destroying the point of the picture. What exactly didn't Spain like about, like, uh, the movie? Well, it was probably similar to what the American censors at the time didn't like about the film. And that, right. that was this, uh, the uh, depiction of sex and the dynamic between Howard mm -hmm. Rourke and Dominique. Yeah. And there was um, an effort on the part of the Hayes office, which was the self-censorship board in Hollywood, to tone down the love scenes and the the electricity between these two yeah. characters. I've seen the movie and it's very passionate. And I also remember that at that time there were like laws in, in Hollywood. Uh, for example, the man and the woman couldn't be sitting down in bed at the same time. So you got to come with like very ingenious right. ways of right. depicting passion. but like following these rules yes. on, on all the things that she uh, that, that you have here about her life. Um, what did she treasure the most? Are, were these things in her home or oh. did she keep? Where did she keep this? Well, there's, an, there's another uh, uh, sequence of, uh, of her participation or engagement with Latin American culture or the culture of Spain in particular. And that was a particular artist mm -hmm. that she collected. She had an art collection displayed in her home. She liked oil paintings. Her husband, Frank O'Connor, was an oil painter. Yeah. And both of them developed a friendship with the Spanish painter, Jose Manuel Capuleti, who, okay. who um, we actually have uh, examples of work on display, and we'll be able to take a close look at those. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've seen them around. Um, was When I read the, the Romantic Manifesto, I, I saw that she was a, a huge, a fan of art and 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 she mm -hmm. she thought that I was one of the most uh, incredible um vehicles right that that we have to um put reason out there and and understand like the the sense of life of of the human being uh did she have any record collection oh yes yeah yeah she was very interested in music music was really a top value for her. And it was a, an art experience that she uh, developed uh, an appreciation for in Russia as a child. Mm -hmm. And then as a young woman in university, she often delayed purchasing streetcar tickets or, or didn't purchase them at all. So she could save up this money and, uh, to purchase operetta tickets right. and to see those performances, which in Russia at that time were completely unlike anything that is currently known about operetta in the West. So besides writing, did she engage in any other art form herself, like maybe a musical instrument or painting or experimenting with something? Well, there were uh, interesting experiments. She studied drawing okay. in, in Russia and every, 10 or 15 boxes of about 160 or some odd boxes of material, we'll find a drawing of hers. Okay. A little sketch of uh, drawing. Actually, she drew a lot of cats. She was a big uh, fan of, of uh, cats and had many of them. But she also 
seriously, you know, worked um, drawing one particular image of her husband. She drew two images of her husband that we have on record. One was when she first saw him as an actor on a set in Hollywood where she was working as an extra. Yeah. Her future husband was dressed as a Roman soldier. And so she sketched him after having seen him for the first time. I mean, wow. And then, um, you know, several decades later, when they're married and, uh, you know, they're both mature, she did a profile of him, mm -hmm. a, a very well done drawing. And, you know, is another uh, example of her, you know, interest in the visual. Now, she also, I think, would have been based on the evidence of her screenplays and the kind of depictions um, and instructions she gave, she would have been a, a really interesting director, okay. film director. Nice. Now I have one other thing to show you. Okay. Uh, an artifact related to Mexico. Okay. So. Nice. She was elected or enrolled in a society and given an honorary membership of a humanistic society in Mexico City. Okay. And this is the diploma that she La Sociedad Mexicana de Estudios Humanísticos. I don't think that exists anymore, but I will check it out. Acredita por medio del presente diploma como acreedora de mérito for humanistic merit, 1960-1961. Now, this is one of the great nice. things about this profession of, of historical artifacts. Mm -hmm. Here is something that has no context for us because we don't understand the dynamic of intellectual societies in the, uh, the capital of Mexico at this time. But with this presentation, you never know what will happen with regard to some independent researcher that will be triggered by uh, yeah. an investigation of this sort of thing. There was apparently an effort by this gentleman to introduce Ayn Rand's uh, transcripts of an Ayn Rand seminar that had occurred that previously that year mm -hmm. that was causing a great deal of, of excitement. And that excitement is something that is captured in a letter from him to her. There apparently was an effort by some journalist in Mexico City to bring a, a transcript of a, a discussion of capitalism to Mexico, have it published in mm -hmm. a, a major paper down there. Right. Unfortunately, the paper, we don't have the, uh, a record of the paper, but we have some indication of what was uh, happening with regard to the enthusiasm for these ideas in Mexico at the time. And here is a letter written by a representative uh, of an organization to her regarding uh, the effort to promote her work in Mexico. And you might want to read uh, some interesting. Yeah, it says, Ms. Ran, I received your last letter. The books arrive in good condition. The diploma we offered you uh, was something registered. The translation of your conference has caused something like a commotion here and has had both extreme results, violent attacks and new supporters to your ideas. And it continues to be the same in Latin America with these ideas, I can tell you. The newspaper that was to print it I believe became categorically afraid. Nothing has changed. This is from 1962, and this is the same situation right now. At least we have internet now. So if you want something published, you don't need to go to a paper. Right. So far, nothing. At first, they wanted me to change some concepts, but I refused. I stated that the conference would be printed just as you gave it, with no changes whatsoever. And this is written in capital letters or I wouldn't permit it. Wow, who's this guy? Octavio Barona. I will I will research. O Octavio Barona, are you out there? Or yeah. maybe you're like grandsons? Yes. <laughs> it would be great to Calling. get in touch with him. Please receive my heartiest greetings and my best desires for your welfare. And, but he also asks her, have you considered printing it in Spanish? I think that by this time, I don't know if there was already a Spanish translation of her books, like when, when that happened. There were, uh, they weren't particularly good. Yeah, and I remember that. Well, now we have a new translation yeah. of, of the At Atlas Shrug. Did she ever reply to this guy? No, we don't have a record of the reply, okay. unfortunately. So, uh, but the good thing about this kind of exchange, the papers of this gentleman may. So, okay. yeah. you know, there's, uh, uh, there's a never ending stream of stuff coming in and some 
measure more of that stream, we're going to examine right now. Well, here's an artifact, number number one. Okay. And first is the desk of Amanda, a writing desk. Wow. This was purchased by her husband, Frank O'Connor, as a gift to her in 1931. Mm -hmm. He uh, picked it up at a studio expendable and lighting company, which provided resources for the studios, equipment and office furniture and so forth. And on this desk, she wrote all of her novels, wow. her screenplays, her most of her nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see in this photo that's behind it, a photo taken by Julia Schulman of I'm in her study at the von Sternberg house in Chatswood, her work on Atlas Road. That's here in, in California? Yes. Mm -hmm. Nice. I like her expression in that picture. She looks very happy. And so all all the paper that we see there probably is one of her novels. Yes, yes. Oh. We think it's Atlas Shrugged. Oh, wow. Because that was um, a work in progress at the time that this uh, photo was taken. Note that the indoor-outdoor lifestyle, which yeah. is unique to California. Right, so right. Writers don't have to be sequestered behind, uh, you know, barricades against the snow. Yeah, that's true. And I was going to ask, when she moved to New York, did she take this desk? Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, the desk. The desk was moved maybe a total of twelve times in her life. Well, these are various objects that are in paintings, some of which were displayed in her home. Okay. From this uh, artist, the Spanish artist uh, Capuletti, Jose Manuel Capuletti, mm -hmm. uh, who was also a friend of the O'Connors and uh, someone that uh, fe featured prominently in her pantheon of Greek. Of artists. Yeah. Here's a photo, a reproduction of a painting of Frank O'Connor. This was her husband again, and this is a depiction of a sunset that, or a sunrise rather, that they observed while visiting San Francisco, another uh -huh. uh, in California. Yeah. Okay. So what you're seeing here yeah. are examples, of reproductions, and enlargement of enlargements of some of the many things that we have in the archives mm -hmm. from. Ayn Rand's papers, the things that she collected. So this is like Clark Gable writing uh, to encourage MGM to buy the film rights of the Fountainhead, right? Right. right. So in that moment, I mean, it strikes me how Hollywood today would would do no effort whatsoever uh, into you know putting these ideas into a motion pictures. But but back then you had uh, stars uh, as big as Clark Gable, like uh, finding the the importance of a novel like The Fountain. Well, that, the novel was also fresh. It was new. It was published in her lifetime, and it was being promoted, and it was catching fire with the American public. Right. And that's what excited Hollywood at the time, because they could make a success, they thought. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, showing me all this amazing uh, articles that definitely have enlightened me more into who was Anne Rand, an exceptional uh, woman, a writer, uh, a philosopher. I hope that you had as much fun as I did. And, uh, and, and all of, uh, of you guys who have been, you know, uh, joining us, I hope that you share this content, uh, and also, you know, uh, think of it that whenever you know someone better, then you can have a better idea of why they stood for what they stood in life. And I'd like to share a little content with you. Yeah. My book, a copy of my Thank book. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, over 124 images from the archives. It's a very interesting introduction to our collections and an interesting presentation, I think, in graphic detail yeah. of the life of Ayn Rand. With all this, like I can take my, my personal souvenir after this, after this tour with me. Thank you very much, Jeff. You're welcome.